All right, I think we're getting started. Um, again, welcome everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Claire. Um, it's so nice to have you all with us today. There's a lot of familiar, I, I won't say faces because I can't see your faces, but there's a lot of um, familiar names in the chat. So welcome again. Um, as I said, I'm Claire, Claire Sternberg. I don't say my last name very often, but gave it a try today. Um, I'm your host for today's Justice Talk event, and I'm also a member of Student Academic Success Programs and the Apple Corps team here at John Jay. Thank you for joining us at this kickoff event for our October event series from Justice Talk to Justice Walk. Um, I also want to take a second to give a hearty shout out to Tamar Montuma for all of her work organizing today's event. Um, so this series emerged from our incredible first year students who explored a variety of justice issues last summer and kept asking, well, what can I do? So we've brought the series back for its second year in the hopes of giving all of you change makers some tools to make a difference in your own ways. We just wanna give you a heads up that this event is being recorded. You can probably see that little light in the left-hand corner. Um, to make the most of this event, please take every opportunity to engage with the speakers and with each other on Zoom. That means dropping things in the chat, asking questions, you could hit the react buttons, um, we want, we want to know what you're thinking, so, so get involved. Um, that said, I'm going to turn it over to my excellent co-host, Katrina Green, who also happens to be an Apple student, to introduce our very special guest. So Katrina, take it away. Welcome, everyone. I have the honor today to introduce Professor Fritz Umbach, who will be leading us today as we learn and explore how and why the NYPD ended up both patrolling New York City schools, as well as interacting with so many of those struggling with mental illness. So without further ado, please help me give Professor Fritz a warm Zoom welcome. Thank you all. I am offering the opportunity for students after this um, chat to work with me for a major journalist from a major out, uh, news outlet who is investigating um, police abuse. Um, and I thought this would be an ideal way to take the information that we talk about today and translate it into real action. Um, and that's one of the things I do in the courses I teach at John Jay is to think about the ways we can use the information that we generate and we learn about in class and apply it in structural and practical ways within the criminal justice system here in New York. Um, so small correction, but there's absolutely an opportunity for students who are interested to work with a journalist with, and me on a database of uh, abusive cops. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I am sort of an unusual bird in that I teach both in history and in criminal justice. I am a historical criminologist. And what that means is that I study crime patterns and patterns in policing over time, as opposed to thinking about what happened last year or the past three years. My research goes back to the 1950s. My books have been mostly about crime and policing in public housing, but I also consult for various city agencies um, in New York City, the New York City Housing Authority, the New York Police Department, and various community-based organizations like the Prisoner Reentry Institute um, and the Vera Institute for Justice. And I think uh, that faculty like me, and I am like a lot of your faculty, John Jay, we're not just professors in the classroom. We're deeply involved in the subject that we are teaching, and we want to pass that activism on to our students. So while I'm a criminologist, in my head, it's always 1974. I'm always thinking about New York City crime um, and New York City in the past as a backdrop for understanding what's going on in the present. And what today what I wanna do is talk a little bit about the current push to defund or abolish the police and to take those arguments on their merits and think about what the recent history of New York City policing, and by recent, I mean going back to the 1970s, can tell us about the possibility for change. Um, so I'm going to, if I can, share screen here. Let's see here. And, all right, everyone have that? Are we on a PowerPoint? 
cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so we recently heard um, profound, real arguments about the importance and the value of defunding the police, abolishing the police. What can we do to change the nature of criminal justice in America? And we often hear that we have to abolish the police or we have to defund the police because the police won't change. They can't change. They've never changed. Um, it's been the same way back to slave patrols and it's the same everywhere. And I think because we're at John Jay, we should take advantage of what we know about how the police have changed and under what conditions they've changed. And there have been some profound changes, at least one of them that I wanna talk about briefly in New York City that can show us how it is that police departments can make real substantive changes. It also underscores how wild and out of control policing was as recently as the 1970s. Um, so I wanna to talk today about police shootings um, and how they have changed over time. Um, and so I've got some charts here um, and you can see that in 1972, and this, this always surprises me, that there were about a thousand shootings a year, right? That cops were shooting in, um, not always hitting um, and not always injuring, but a thousand times a year, three times a day, they were firing at suspects. An extraordinary um, fact. And not only were they shooting at suspects three times um, a day, but we were firing an extraordinary number of shots. In 1972, there were 2,500 shots fired in New York City. Um, this is an out of control situation. This is policing without restraint. But let's look at the recent history. We went from 964 shootings in 1972 to just 92 shootings in 2011. And by shootings here, we mean not killings, but when an officer discharged their weapon at all for any reason. One of the great things about studying policing in New York City is that we have incredible data. Um, if I were a historian of policing in Boise, Idaho, we wouldn't know much. But New York City, in part because the city has such a strong activist community, maintains astounding records and has for a very long time. Um, and so when we talk about this data, we don't have this data for other police departments to the same degree. New York is one of the places where we've just got extraordinary data. This is a huge drop then and a very real one from a thousand shots a year to under a hundred by 2011. Um, and it plummets between 1972 and 1997, the number of incidents. At the same time, um, you can see that um, the total number of shots has fired down to 416. 416 shots fired a year. And that's not just at suspects, that's also at canine shootings. And we keep track in New York City of the number of times officers discharge a weapon against dogs. Um, and it's a surprising number of times, actually. Um, and 416 shots. What that means is that if you've joined the police force in the last 15 years, you'll likely retire without ever having fired your service weapon in anger. Most cops in New York City will never fire their service weapon in anger. How did this happen? How did we go from a thousand shootings a year to under a hundred? Um, and you can see not only is it under a hundred, but it's been pretty low since the 1990s. And John Jay played a big role in this. There was this guy, John Fife, who was a former uh, NYPD officer, became a professor at John Jay. And he said, you know, one of the things that cops really care about is their own career. Um, and if we make stringent rules about when and under what conditions you can fire your service weapon, cops who care about their career 
whether or not they um, care about the political issues behind that issue. If we make it punishable, if you fire your, your weapon inappropriately, then you're going to be punished. Cops are gonna stop shooting at people to such a degree. And within a couple of years, he was able to bring the department shootings down by three quarters. And it continued to plummet. And since the 1990s, it has been about the same, right? We do not see much variation year to year for the past 20 years. New York City police officers compared to off police officers elsewhere in the country just don't fire that weapon that often. But not only did things get um, safer for, in terms of the total number of shots, the number of individuals killed by police officers in New York City has been low comparatively for 20 years. You can see that in 2011, we, uh, NYPD, uh, officer-involved shootings only involved nine fatalities. And it's been that way since the late 1990s. The number goes up or down periodically, but these are very small numbers, right? In a metro area of 8 million people that only nine people have been killed in police interactions is sort of astounding, particularly when you compare it to 1993. I mean, to uh, 1972, when there were 93 killings by police officers. Um, and this drop is remarkable. But not only did things get safer for people on the street, um, it also got safer for police. The less police fire uh, their service weapon, the less they're shot back at. Um, and that means that things got safer for suspects on the street and safer for cops. And you can see that in the 70s, we are losing 50 cops a year, right? Um, shot or injured. We often go with only a handful of police officers injured in the line of duty every year. Um, 35,000 police officers in New York City, 2010, only two were injured or killed um, in shootings. Again, an astounding drop. So why did it work with Fife? It worked with Fife in part because he was working within the police department. He got buy-in from police officers. And he figured out levers that would work with police officers. And he persuaded the police officers that this was going to be better for them as well. Now, this drop didn't happen somehow because violent crime was going down in New York City. Here we've got a chart of violent crime in, 19, in New York City, 1965 to 1975. And you can see the extraordinary increase in violent crime. We can talk about why violent crime increased so much in New York in the 1960s. But this drop in police officer shootings happens even as crime is going up. So Fife was able to figure out how, even when crime was going up, we could lower police shootings. If it were true, that there's nothing we can do about police departments, that they're unreformable, that all cops are bastards, a cab, as the graffiti tells us every day when we walk down the streets, then you would expect to see about the same number of uh, police involved shootings per 10,000 residents in all police departments everywhere in the country. And what you see in fact is an extraordinary variation that police department policy matters a great deal. Um, and some of the most violent police departments are not big city police departments. In fact, the most dangerous places to, uh, to, to be on the street vis-a-vis -vis police um, is not New York. We're actually at the bottom of the list, uh, but Albuquerque, New Mexico and Tucson, Arizona. Um, and we see extraordinary difference by police department. What, we, what these differences tell us, 12.5 to 0.9 in New York City, is that police department policy matters. That police can do things differently with different results. Um, and when we see such a wide variation, that tells us that there's opportunities for intervention. If we saw the same number of shootings um, in every police department everywhere in the United States, I would say, you're right, there's nothing we can do. No variation means no possibility for change. 
But when I look at this variation and I see so many of the worst cities being mid or small cities, then I know that there's things that cops can do. There's things we can do with the police, reforms we can make that make a difference. I also think um, it's important for New Yorkers to understand where we fall in this hierarchy of abusive police departments. We're at the bottom, right? We're among the least abusive police departments in the United States. Um, we're just also the media capital of the country. And so everything that happens here gets covered in depth. On the other hand, if you're in Tucson, Arizona, you're off the map. Those police departments operate in the, in the media shadows. We just um, don't have the same number of activists and the same number of journalists tracking the police departments in the same way that we do in New York City. Uh, and every police shooting in New York City or anywhere else is a tragedy. On the other hand, the numbers in New York City are extraordinarily small compared to the rest of the country. Before I move on to the next issue, I wanna open the floor up to questions. One of the things that happens at John Jay is students don't often get a chance to ask broad questions of faculty because everyone is focused on the readings and sometimes they're worried that their questions about the readings have high stakes attached to them. Is this going to affect how the professor thinks about me? And so I'm hoping to have a free ranging conversation about these numbers, which you may not see in your other classes. Um, questions in general about how we make sense of these numbers and what they might mean. So I'm eager to hear questions. I haven't looked at the chat, but I'm relying on others to tell me all about that. Oh, I see a hand from Aaron Fernando. Mr. Brown, how are you? Hi, Professor. Uh, thank you for having this. Um, I just had a question. This is very interesting data. Um, this chart you're showing right now with the uh, rate of police shootings in cities, uh, could there be a correlation to that with higher crime in certain cities? That would be another way to crunch the data. And one of the interesting things that's happened nationally with crime is that big cities, for whatever people in the suburbs think, are with some exceptions, significantly safer than mid and small cities. That much of the action in crime these days is happening in mid to small cities. You're much more at risk for assault, murder, or rape in Tucson than you are in New York City. We have in our heads the idea of big city, big crime, um, but with some exceptions like Chicago, that's just not true and hasn't been for some time. But Aaron, it's a really good question. And another way to crunch this data would be to look at the number of police shootings per unit of crime. Although I'd point out that the number of police shootings has been low, even in the high crime era in New York City. So our peak in murders in New York City was 1991. And already by then, our shootings were way down. Um, and so at least in New York, there isn't this correlation between high crime and a large number of police shootings that you can have both high crime and low police shootings. Aaron, have I answered your question or, or any follow-ups there? I think that makes sense. So you're saying there could be a correlation, but in New York City, it seems to be uncorrelated. In New York City, at least, it is uncorrelated, but it is a worthy topic of exploration, right? Police shootings not as a, as a rate for 10,000 residents, but as a rate for crime, unit of crime would be a, another interesting way to crunch the numbers. Got it. Thank you. I am keeping my eyes on the chat, and I will let you know when there are questions. Okay. Um, so the next issue uh, that I want to talk about is the NYPD and what's known as the EDP. We no longer use in academic publications EDP, which was short for emotionally distressed person um, because it seems pejorative, uh, but cops on the street still use it. And one of the interesting things about um, EDP calls to the NYPD is that they represent the vast bulk of police shootings, um, whether they end in a fatality or injury or not. Um, they are disproportionately um, interactions with EDP. And that the number of EDP calls has gone up 
astoundingly in the past 10 years. You can see that in 2009, it was 97,000 um, EDP calls to the NYPD. You can do your own calculation about how many times there's a 911 call about an EDP per day, if there's 97,000 a year. Um, and that was a low point, right? We're now at 180,000 180, EDP calls a year. Um, and this increase in calls to respond to EDP has been occurring as the number of police officers in New York City has barely budged. And so the police are being called on to perform this service that in many ways they're not trained for um, and represent a new aspect of policing. In the next side, you can see where people struggling with mental illness have been historically in the United States. In the 50s and 60s, most people suffering from mental illness were in mental hospitals. Um, and then in the 70s and 80s, for a variety of reasons, we went through a period of deinstitutionalization. That is um, where we decided that we could move people out of mental institutions and into communities um, where they were from, and that they would somehow get treatment um, in those communities. But what happened, as opposed to going from mental institutions and getting treatment in the community, many of them just ended up in prison. We often talk about America living through an age of mass incarceration. But if we think about the 1950s, we had about the same number of people in prison as we incarcerated as we do now, but they were in mental institutions as opposed to prison. We just shifted where we incarcerated people. We went from a period of mass institutionalization to mass incarceration, but we had the same number of people under state control. They were just in different places. Um, and this has turned cops into frontline mental health workers, but they're not trained for that job. And I think where people who are calling for defunding or abolishing the police and police officers themselves have some common ground is cops don't really want to be in this business. They would love to be defunded on the issue of dealing with EDP. Um, because they're not trained for it. They're perhaps not the best people to respond. Um, and the problem that we have is that not so much that we need to defund the police, but that we've defunded mental health in the United States. We have a policing problem with EDP that is dealt with by calls for defunding the police because we've defunded everything else in society. Importantly for understanding police community relations in New York City is the extent to which um, those calls for EDP come from minority neighborhoods, neighborhoods with high Black and Latinx populations. You'll see that they're significantly more likely to come from communities of color than they are from white neighborhoods, not because white people suffer from mental illness less, but because for a variety of issues, including racism, white New Yorkers are more likely to have the resources and their families to have the resources to handle the challenges of mental illness. Whereas in communities of color, under-resourced um, and with poorer households, they don't have the resources to deal with that. But again, Few police officers have been trained to deal with EDP calls, right? Only about a third. Um, and one of the ironies of the call for defunding the police is that training programs like EDP, how to best to deal with um, people struggling with mental illness, when we defund the police, those are the very programs that are most likely to be cut first. When we call for defunding the police, what we're really doing is calling for the defunding of the training that might make it possible for police to deal more adequately with calls for emotional distress. But again, where calls to defund the police 
and police officers themselves would agree, is this very issue? Cops would love to get out of this business. And before the late 1970s and early 1980s, they weren't in this job. That when uh, we had a different approach to mental health, this wasn't something police officers had to do in their daily um, beats. All right, I'm gonna pause there while we think about those numbers and take some more questions on those, on those topics. If you want to unmute and ask a question, the chat is open. We do have a question. Um, a student is asking, what kinds of courses can students take to receive this kind of information, data, and statistics? Oh, that is a really good question. Um, what I first want to say is how important knowing statistics and understanding numbers and feeling comfortable with numbers um, are for getting jobs in the field. Um, I wish I had a dollar for every time that I heard someone in a community-based organization or a professional in the criminal justice system say, I don't need another fierce advocate for justice. I need someone who's fierce with an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, that People who are good with numbers get jobs. Um, and people who can crunch numbers are always going to be better off um, in terms of employability than people who can't. And the earlier you start getting comfortable with numbers and thinking about numbers, um, the more likely you are to increase your employment prospects. Um, so of course, absolutely. Um, the CJ program at John Jay teaches any number of statistical statistics classes. I'm particularly fond of, and students should be aware of, what's known as the spatial turn in criminal justice. That increasingly, what matters to police departments, as well as to uh, reformers and advocates, is thinking about how crime and policing varies by geography and the things that we can discover by mapping out crime um, and mapping out the interaction between crime and communities and mapping out social phenomenon. And so as soon as you can, I would take a course in spatial statistics. Right now, I'm currently teaching a course with Professor Valerie West, um, who's actually in the room with me called Fighting Injustice with Numbers. And it's an introductory course to thinking quantitatively. And in the end, thinking quantitatively is much more important than being able to do elaborate calculations. That it's being able to think through numbers more than it is doing wild mathematical formulas. Um, and being comfortable with thinking quantitatively is one of the skills that I really wish John Jay students would get. And it always breaks my heart when I hear a senior say, if only Professor Umbach, someone had told me this my first year, I would have taken a different set of courses. Um, I myself failed all my high school math classes and did my best to avoid taking any math classes in college. And it was only later after I became a professor and I really suddenly needed to be able to do math because of this quantitative spatial turn that I just taught myself statistics. Um, and so it's never too late to get these skills. Um, and I expect that Professor Valerie West and I will teach that class again, um, but it's a good gateway drug to thinking about numbers. Did I answer the question? I'm not sure if the asker, I don't see feedback at the moment, but yes, yes you did. Yes, okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so I want to move on to a more difficult topic in New York, thinking about New York City crime, and that is who is the criminally active population in New York City and how do we know? Um, and I'm choosing my language there very carefully. If we call someone a criminal, we are labeling them. We are saying that is the essence of their being. Um, and so we're much more likely, those of us who think about these issues, to use a phrase, the criminally active. 
The next question is, how do we know who the criminally active are in New York City? And we often think, well, we know who the criminally active are based off arrests. But that could reflect the bias of police officers, either in their thinking or in their actions. That police potentially might pursue certain types of suspects over others more likely to arrest certain types of individuals and let others go with a warning. And so arrest statistics are useful in their own way, but they don't really give us um, or potentially mislead us into knowing who the criminally active population is in any area. But in New York City, at least, we have another way of figuring out who's criminally active. Can anyone guess how we think about who might be committing crimes? Who would we ask if not officers? The people? Yes, Mr. Joseph, yes. That if you are a victim of a crime, it stands to reason that you are going to accurately describe your perception of the person um, who committed the crime against you. If you were mugged by a nearly retired history professor, um, you're not going to say it was a 20-year-old Latina who mugged me. Maybe, okay? Because chances are you want the cops to find that person. And so one of the things that we do in New York City is we keep, we tabulate victim reports of who victimized them. Um, and we um, then compare that, we organize that data by racial groupings. Um, and we know that data um, to a surprising degree for a large number of crimes. Now, there's some crimes where we just don't know. Burglary, for example, because you never see the person um, who does it. But for other crimes where there are victims, or in the case of homicides, witnesses, we have a fair degree of knowledge of who committed the crime. And what we see here is all of the various crimes in New York City running along the X axis. And on the Y axis, um, we have the um, percentage the re, um, where we know the race of the suspect who did it. So for example, in um, disruption of religious services, we know to 100 degree, 100 percent, the um, racial identification of the suspects. The red line, tells us the number of Black or Latinx individuals who victims reported as having committed the crime. Um, and you can see the spread then of the criminally active population in New York City um, by racial identification. Now, of course, there's all sorts of problem with racial data, in part because race is an invention, right? There aren't really racial differences between people biologically. Um, race is also a matter of perception, and racial categories change all the time. Um, a classic example is that in 1940, census takers considered Mexicans and people coming from Puerto Rico, from the islands, to be white, right? That was the racial category um, in a way that we would not think of those groups today. 20 years from now, how we think about race will change again. And we will find how we organize people by race today laughable. Your kids or grandkids will make fun of you that you believe that there were Blacks and Latinx and Asians. There'll be a whole different set of categories and you'll have to defend how you thought today in 2021 about race. But setting that aside, we know a great deal about the criminally active population in New York City. I'm gonna look at another slide here, how the um, NYPD organizes this data. Let's see here, why can't I? Come on, yeah. Okay. Um, 
And I'm pulling this from publicly available data. Um, this is rape victims, suspects, and arrests by ethnicity. Um, and rape in some way is um, a difficult crime statistically because there's so much underreporting of rape. On the other hand, um, racial identification is, um, there's, there's a lot of interact time um, for perception of, of the race of the suspect. And you'll see that um, the suspect and arrestee racial identification are very similar, right? There's not much gap between um, who we arrest for rape and who victims identified as um, the, the perpetrator. There's slightly, when the suspect is black, there's slightly more gap um, between um, the arrestees and the suspect as identified by the victim with Latin X New Yorkers, but still not a huge mismatch. The other thing that stands out, or actually I'll open to this, what else do you see in the graph that's intriguing? Right. It may be a little bit tough. Um, I know I'm having a hard time reading the categories. So I'm wondering. Yeah, so, okay. Um, this might just be one of the problems with Zoom. Um, but I will point a few things out because it's true for rape as it is for most crimes. Almost all crime in New York City is intraracial. That is, it happens within the same population groups. Victims and suspects um, share identities, racial identities, um, and that there's very little crime in New York City that occurs cross-racially. Um, and this is important for understanding how we think about crime in New York City, is that people of color are overwhelmingly, disproportionately, the victims of crime. We have a comment yeah. in the chat. Um, um, the student that says, when you ask the question about what they're noticing, they say that they notice how people of color are higher in all of the categories compared to white people. That is true. That is undeniably true. <laughs> That's, um, that um, there are very few white arrestees for rape, for rape. There are very few white victims of rape in New York City, um, and there's almost uh, no um, white perpetrators. Um, and that is because rape, like other forms of violent crime, clusters in poor communities. And in New York City, class and race overlap. If we were in Boise, Idaho, they wouldn't overlap race and class would be, um, wouldn't be overlapping. Uh, but here in New York City, they do. And because crime and poverty track each other so closely, in New York City, overwhelmingly, the victims of crime are going to be individuals of color. And to care about crime is to care about people of color. And to care about people of color and their lives in New York is to care about crime. We have a new question that just popped in the chat. Mm -hmm. This question is, why are there fewer arrests for white people? Well, there are fewer arrests for white people because there are fewer white suspects, right? Um, the, uh, I don't think that, let's see here. Um, only, 10% of suspects of rape in New York City are white, and 5% of the arrestees are white. Um, it is true that there's a larger gap between white suspects and white arrestees than there is between black suspects and, and black arrestees. Um, and it is an interesting question why there's that gap. Um, Although I'm not sure that gap holds up for other crimes, but it's worth inter but it's worth thinking about. And I would say to the student, you're getting into the business of criminology. You are asking the right kind of questions. 
These are the questions that make careers that help police departments. Why is there that 5% gap? Um, and it's an excellent question and suggests a really good instinct for thinking about these numbers. No more questions in the chat at the moment. One of the um, curious things to happen in New York City politics is the likely election of Eric Adams to the New York City mayorship. And um, Adams is fascinating as an individual, um, not only a former NYPD officer, but a John Jay graduate. Um, and he was ran a campaign that in fact argued against many of the tenets of abolish the police, defund the police. And he was most successful in low crime white neighborhoods electorally. Sorry, I'll say that again. Yes, I'll say, I, I wanna be clear about that. He was least successful electorally. That is he got the smallest share of the votes in low crime white neighborhoods and was most successful in communities of color and in communities that suffered from high rates of crime. And I think there's a lesson there for how it is that we think about crime in New York City. Adam's electoral success speaks not only to the fabulous training one gets at John Jay, but to the new politics of crime, um, where it's not a white versus black issue. Um, and that communities of color are increasingly demanding their fair share of municipal services. That to be treated fairly is to be treated not just um, constitutionally by the police, but to have their concerns about crime taken seriously. Other questions? All right. Uh, so to sum up, I think that what the history of New York City tells us is that we can change police departments and we should change police departments because they are, they are changeable, that they are not monolithic blocks of granite. Um, change isn't gonna be easy and we always have to reform. What last year's reform frequently becomes this year's problem. Um, but that doesn't mean reform is a bad idea. It just means that reform is a process. It's not once and done, but an ongoing engagement between citizens who care about just policing and police departments that are reluctant to change, but are decidedly changeable. At the same time, I think this graph tells us that to care about communities of color is to care about issues of public safety. Um, that the, it is such communities that suffer both from overly aggressive policing and too much crime. Um, and that is a new way, I think, to think about crime. And there's increasingly space for that kind of subtle and nuanced thinking in New York City. We have some more feedback in the chat. Okay. Um, and this student is more than welcome to unmute and ask directly. Um, I just, I hope that I, I read these questions correctly. So definitely student jump in if you'd like to, if you'd like to ask these questions. All right. Why are some cops discriminating against black people when it comes to death row or death penalty from different states that they are in? Some people can be innocent and did not do the crime. Uh, well, remember that cops don't sentence people, right? That is a different part of the criminal justice system. Um, and that those decisions are not the decisions of cops, um, but of juries and judges. Okay. And again, definitely jump in, student, if you'd like to ask more about that. Um, I see- okay. I have oh, a question. Mm -hmm. So what if the, the rules were switched, like the judges and juries were discriminating against black people? 
there's a lot of research about um, capital punishment cases. Um, and in fact, one thing I could do is turn it over to an expert here on capital uh, justice cases. We happen to have one here in the room. Um, I'm joined by Professor Valerie West, who I think did one of her first academic articles on racial disparities in ca capital justice crimes. Hi, everyone. How are you? What was the question again? Um, I said if the rules were switched, um, judges and juries discriminate against Black people when it comes to death row and death penalty. And <laughs> So the, the reason you're right, there's a lot of innocent people on death row and a lot of innocent people have been found to be factually innocent, not just legally innocent. The distinction is whether or not the rules were followed. Um, that doesn't preclude factual innocence and factual innocence is we got the wrong guy and we know who the right guy is. Um, Professor Mbach earlier on said that the majority of, of criminal events, including homicide, are committed by people of the same race or the same group you're most at risk with people like you than you are with a dangerous stranger. Um, it's also true that death row is disproportionately African-American. It's about 52 to 49% um, white over black um, or black over white. Uh, so you're asking a whole series of questions that confound the process from the investigation of who's been killed, the the, in the world of capital sentencing, the issue about race is also focused, it on, focused on the race of the victim as a crucial predictor of what happens at the end of the case. So the majority of people who are on um, death row are there for an interracial, not intraracial event. Uh, I don't know if this totally answers your, your question, but it's a lot more complicated. My own re research suggests that juries are more likely to convict anyone, white or black, of, of a capital event if they live near large black populations. So they're responding to a, a, a racialized fear in general that they express both for white defendants and black defendants. And that's independent of the racial makeup of the jury. Independent of the racial makeup of the jury. That's irrelevant of the racial makeup of the jury. Um, so it's a, both a more complex situation than we have understood it uh, and also a, a addresses race in a very different kind of way. It's not individuals being biased, although that certainly happens and there's a lot of evidence for that. And those stories make the paper because they're so egregious. But as an overall phenomenon, um, it is a very complex expression of social disquietude for lack of a better word. Does that answer your question? Yes, and also just to say something, um, I'm back. Um, you said the cops can't um, decide, but when, you know, Central Park Five, when the police just, um, just took in the Black person that they knew that they raped the woman, but the, he, they, the group didn't really did it. So you so should, it, let me suggest a, a really good documentary for you called What Jennifer Saw. Um, it's an old PBS documentary on DNA evidence and policing and a young white woman was raped in her home while sleeping. An African American man was convicted of the crime. And while he was incarcerated, he identified the person who actually did it, who was also Af African American, but not him, using the language at the time of the event. The police in this video said, and this is the important part, I always knew mistakes happened, but I always thought that if I did my job right, that I would not make mistakes. Um, and yet this still happened. Uh, so the police, even in the best, they're gonna make mistakes. Even when they do everything right, they're gonna make mistakes. So do we have a way to detect those mistakes and try to get police to do everything right? Uh, so it's a, it's a very deep and troubling complex issue. I wish it were as simple as the, the police are biased or racist and we can get rid of the biased or racist police, but that's not what happens. So both things can be true. There could be biased and racist police officers and there certainly are. Um, and I think the uh, recent FBI raid to the home of the um, head of the Sergeant's Benevolent Association is gonna reveal a trove of police racism. It's that police racism doesn't account for, explain, or fully explain all the outcomes in yeah. such cases. Uh, 
Professor Umbach said it better than I. Yes, that's exactly right. And it is, it's deeply troubling, right? Because it's an expression of larger social issues that have nothing to do with the police, that the police are just part of, not the um, initiator of. We have some more questions in the chat. Thank you, Professor West. Thank you, Professor West. Uh, Professor West teaches a spatial statistics class if you're interested in crime mapping here at John Jay. Um, and if you're imagining a career or envisioning a career for yourself in criminal justice, crime mapping is uh, the big new thing. Okay, should we do some more questions or do you wanna keep going and save questions for that? No, them? no, let's, let's do questions. Great, we got a few. Okay, so we have a student that says, you mentioned a reform will have to take place and obviously reform takes a while. It can't be done just at once. How long will you say a successful reform will take? Well, it's, what do we, some reforms are harder than others, right? Um, the interesting thing as I, and I'll go back to the slide here, is how quickly Fife was able to reform shootings in the New York City Police Department, that it just took, a year or two, um, and suddenly police shootings in two years were a quarter of where they were before. That's a pretty quick reform. Um, other problems, which are more entrenched, take longer. Um, and so there's low hanging fruit, and then there's deeply entrenched problems, and different reforms take different amounts of time. Okay, here's a question that may need some clarification. Um, what other kinds of ways can we reform police that can have more society awareness? You know, what's interesting about um, the criminal justice system in the United States, as opposed to elsewhere in sort of peer countries, the industrialized West, is we just have an astounding Friggingly huge amount of police departments. We have 18,000 or so police departments, um, which are under very little regulation and do not coordinate their activities. France has four police departments. Our closest competitor for fragmentation is Canada, and they have 200 police departments. And so one of the reasons that reform is so hard in the United States is that it's piecemeal. We have with one ex two exceptions, no way to nationally reform the police department. Um, the two ways that we can reform police departments wholesale um, are one, litigation. And one of the things that happened in the wake of Fife's success in reducing police shootings in New York City is that other people in other cities went to police departments and said, we are going to sue you if you're not able to bring down the shootings in the same way that New York City has. The police departments became, as a result of a series of court cases, became financially responsible for misbehavior. And this served as sort of a national directive on police departments in a way that our highly fragmented criminal justice system rarely sees. Um, and as a consequence of such litigation, within about 12 years, um, we saw similar drops in police shootings nationwide, that it was the threat of litigation caught the attention of police departments um, and police chiefs. And police chiefs themselves said, oh my God, if I don't want a $10 million lawsuit, I'm going to have to change how we do business. So that's one way we can do national reform. Another way, um, and this has started, it's about 15 years old now, are what's known as consent decrees between the Department of Justice um, and individual police departments. Um, and that is in essence where the Department of Justice enters into a legal contract with the police department, where the police department goes into receivership. It becomes um, a controlled by the Department of Justice, and they have to make profound changes to live up to the consent decree. William Bratton, um, who was um, first the transit police chief in New York City, and then the um, NYPD commissioner, and then goes to LA under a consent decree 
the LAPD is under consent decree before he gets there. And he says that minus the consent decree, he never would have been able to achieve the reforms, the um, reigning in of police abuses that he was able to do in LAPD. Um, and so consent decrees are the other way um, that we can enact reform, not just on individual bad apple cops, but entire police departments. And there's about 15, 17 police departments currently under a consent decree of some sort in the United States. Okay, I thought I just heard someone starting to unmute there, maybe not. Um, we do have another question in here. Do you think that capital punishment is a deterrent to crime? And do you think the reason that crime in New York has decreased is somehow correlated to the abolishment of capital punishment in New York State? Well, I'm going to give my answer, but I'm going to give my answer while Professor West is nearby listening um, and she can correct me. My understanding of the research is that capital punishment does not, in fact, um, <laughs> deter crime. And we know this from cases where people will commit a crime in a neighboring state with capital punishment and they'll still do the still still commit the crime that there's not much correlation between capital punishment and the degree of crime but i'm going to defer to the expert that's correct um, there's some there's some evidence um that if you have a whole bunch of like if you kill a lot of people if the state executes a lot of people you might have a small deterrent effect but it's, uh, that's only from Texas, uh, which is an outlier in all things. Generally, all of the research agrees that capital sentencing is not a deterrent to crime. Um, New York hasn't exactly abolished capital sentencing. Uh, it was, there was, for about six months in 1995, we had capital sentencing on the books and it was reviewed and found to be faulty and it just has le been left like that. There's no, formal abolition and there's no formal adoption. So it's in abeyance. Okay, thank you both. Um, I don't see more questions coming at the moment. We have about five more minutes left. Um, I'm not sure if there's more that you wanted to cover. No, I think I, I, I've covered everything I wanted to cover. What I'm uh, most interested is hearing from students. But if there's no more questions, because now is a great time to ask those questions, particularly about career paths. Anyone want to unmute and go for it and be bold? Okay, no bold. All right, well, uh, please do share my contact information or Professor Valerie West's contact information um, if you're interested in taking classes in statistics. Um, and I'm always here to answer questions and give career advice. Can you, you mentioned an opportunity at the beginning of your presentation. I will send out, a, it's a little complex, so I'll send out an email to you and you can send it to all the participants. Does that work? Sounds good. Okay. It was great. So many smart questions. I really look forward to having you folks in my classroom. There's one last question that I see um, from Tyrell. As a John Jay student, what are some things that we can do uh, like right now? Uh, well, you can do the research with me with the journalists looking at the recently released 50A disciplinary records from the police department. Um, the other thing I would recommend is to think about reform in a smart fashion. Um, you're in college and so now it's an opportunity to move beyond sort of Instagram politics and Instagram information and think about these things in subtle and nuanced ways. Because if we define the problem in the wrong way, we're gonna get reforms that don't work. Um, and so one of the great things about being a John Jay is the opportunity to think about these issues in a real deep fashion so that we come up with the best possible reforms as opposed to reforms that are likely to dis disappoint us all. All right, I'll see you guys in the classroom. Okay, started to talk before unmuting, not wise. Um, thank you, thank you so much, Professor Umbach. And thank you everyone for the questions. Um, thank you to my co-hosts. Um,
We hope that you enjoyed today's justice talk. If you're interested in more ways to make a difference and take action, I want to bring your attention to our next Justice Walk event coming up on October 12th, 140, Community Hour. It's called Speaking My Truth, Telling Our Story, Spoken Word Poetry in Community with Professor Crystal Ensley. Um, we will be sending out an RSVP link to this event. You can see it up on your screen. Um, and again, thank you all for coming.